Ring-a-ling-a-ling, y'all. It's Sabbath school time, and I'm here to help teachers and front row students think creatively and critically so you can get the most out of your class. Now, this quarter, you know we're studying Daniel, and today we're covering the lesson for February the 22nd, 2020, from the stormy sea to the clouds of heaven. We are wading into deeper water now with Daniel chapter 7, so let's go! We're back to the first year of Belshazzar, so about 553 BC or so, when Daniel was somewhere around 67 years old, ready to retire and collect social security. Now Daniel sees a vision of four beasts rising up out of the sea, and this is the apocalyptic part of Daniel. And so the imagery we see is very significant. It begins with the four winds, but first let's talk about the sea. Now, the sea in the ancient world, it represented chaos. In, in Genesis 1, the earth was without form and void, and it says the spirit hovered over the waters. Now, in Enuma Elish, the Babylonian creation story, well, it says that when the earth was unnamed, the waters mingled together. And it's from these chaotic waters that the world was created. And what makes the scene even more chaotic is, is that the four winds are just churning up the water. You know, like a storm. Like the four winds are coming from every direction. It's bad enough when the, when the wind is like blowing the water one way, but if the wind is coming from every direction at once, it's, it's, oh, you just don't want to be sailing on that water, right? So we know already that whatever is about to happen in this chapter, it is not going to be good, right? Now, the four beasts are seen as coming out of the water, right? And they're all kind of Franken beasts, freaks of nature. They're described as a lion, bear, and leopard. And the, right, the first is like a lion with eagle's wings. And the, the point of these animal descriptions is to associate the quality of these animals with these beasts, right? So lions are strong, eagles are fast. And Daniel, of course, asked the angel what these beasts mean. And the angel tells him in verse 17 that they represent four kings or kingdoms that will rise from the earth. We've already had a dream about that back in chapter 2, haven't we? Well, it turns out these four beasts are the same as the four metals we saw in Daniel 2. How do we know that Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 are connected? Hey, that's a good question you might want to ask your class if they seem a little bit too overconfident about this interpretation. Well, just maybe by way of a few answers here. In, in both chapters, we see the rise of four successive empires, one after the other, okay? It's, Chances are they're probably the same empires and not two different sets of four successive empires. We also have the same corresponding imagery. Just as gold is the most precious of metals, so lions were considered the noblest of all beasts. But let's not get into all of that. Just be aware that the connection between Daniel 2 and 7 is something we often assume, but we usually don't take the time to prove it from the text. You may find it's worth doing so. Now, the lesson points out that the lion beast represents Babylon, right? The, the bear represents Persia, the leopard represents Greece, and the fourth beast represents Rome. This should not be too controversial. Daniel 2 tells us the first empire was Babylon. We obviously see Persia replacing Babylon in chapter 5, and chapter 8 tells us that Greece beats Persia. And as for the fourth kingdom being Rome, well, I don't know. Read the New Testament. And just as the medals of Daniel 2, decrease in intrinsic value as we go down the statue. So the beasts seem to descend from the noble lion to this fourth beast, which is just a monster. Daniel doesn't associate it with any known animal, and its, its behavior is just so bad that Daniel doesn't think of, of the first three beasts. He doesn't, he doesn't spend much time dwelling on them. His focus, his focus is on the fourth beast. And that's where we should be looking to and spending most of our time in our class. It's tempting to talk about the lion and the eagle's wings and what it means that it stood on two feet, but you can spend your whole class time on these details. This lesson is not a word-for-word -word study of this chapter. So, hey, stay focused. Keep your eyes here. All right, Monday. Now, the fourth beast has 10 horns, and an 11th horn begins to grow, uprooting three of the 10 horns. We call this the little horn, even though... We imagine it grows to be full size. And what makes this horn different is the three things that D'Souza mentions. Number one, it speaks arrogant, perhaps blasphemous words against God. Number two, it persecutes God's people. And number three, it changes times 
and laws. And it's a genuinely scary moment because it's, when you're, when you're looking at this vision, when you're reading it, it, it's like that moment in a scary movie where like the monster is killing people and suddenly he just like turns and looks at the camera. Right? He looks at you. It's like he sees you watching him. You thought you were safe, you know, on the other end of the, of the TV, but it's like he looks at the camera and now he's looking at you. And, and that's, kind of, that's kind of the effect that happens in this chapter. Daniel could, could feel safe watching these beasts blow each other up, but this little horn seems aware of something the beasts aren't. He is spiritually aware. And Nebuchadnezzar just wanted to rule the world, right? He is ignorant of God. Uh, but this little horn wants to rule God. It's much more sinister. It's chilling. Right? He's not just killing people. He's specifically targeting God's people. Whew, sure, the Babylonians burned down the temple, right? But they were just in the way, right? God's people were just in the way of the Babylonians. But the little horn is targeting God's people because they are God's people. And the difference between the beasts and the little horn is the difference between fighting a war and killing enemy soldiers and committing a holocaust. This little horn reigns for 1260 years. That's the interpretation of times, time, and half a time. And if you, you need to freshen up your knowledge about a day for a year and why a time equals a year and all of that, feel free to do so. There's plenty of good commentaries on Daniel out there, like Zdravko Stefanovic's. Yes, that's how you pronounce his name. You know the book's been sitting on your shelf forever and you're never sure how to say his name when you recommend it to others. There you go. The lesson wants us to understand this little horn power as the papacy. And I would just say, don't shy away from that interpretation, okay? You don't have to apologize for it, but deal with this subject wisely, okay? Imagine a Catholic coming into your church for the first time and joining you for Sabbath school. Choose your words very carefully. Be careful how you respond to others in the class because we know that some members in our Sabbath school classes, uh, they look at Sabbath school as a time where Adventists talk to Adventists and they use the insider language and shortcut language and they're maybe not always aware that there may be visitors and I think it's probably a good habit that we're always um, aware that somebody may be visiting with us and how things may sound to them. So. Again, you don't have to water down or apologize for this interpretation. Just don't let the class conversation descend into anti-Catholicism and Jesuit conspiracies, okay? Stay focused on what Daniel 7 says. On to Tuesday. We see a courtroom in the middle of Daniel 7. Now, there's a reason why this courtroom is in the middle of the chapter, and we're going to get to that at the end of this video. Now, the lesson notes that this judgment happens after the 1260 year reign of the little horn, but before Jesus comes. And as a result of this little horn, the, the courtroom is set up with the Ancient of Days presiding as judge, and it, it says multiple thrones were set up, and it doesn't tell us who sat on them, nor does it tell us specifically what books were opened. The Ancient of Days, of course, we know, he's, he's formidable in his wheelchair with flaming wheels. And let's just be honest, if I ever have to use a wheelchair, that's the kind of wheelchair I want. I want flaming wheels on my throne. And the effect of the judgment isn't completely clear. Daniel says that the fourth beast was thrown into a blazing fire, but the first three beasts only had their ruling authority removed. That seems like a kind of, sort of, final judgment, not quite final, pre-final judgment. Anyways, this judgment seems to be in two phases. First, the Ancient of Days takes his seat and convenes the court. Meanwhile, the Little Horn is still mouthing off down on earth until the beast he has grown out of is destroyed. On to Wednesday, where we see phase two. Phase two begins with the arrival of the Son of Man. And at this point, the Christians have their hands up like, ooh, 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 I know this one, I know this one. It's Jesus, it's Jesus. Yes, 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 but let's not jump ahead. Okay, the Son of Man phrase is used a hundred times in the book of Ezekiel to refer mostly to Ezekiel. Psalm 8.4 asks, what is man that you are mindful of him, right? We all know that psalm, but in the Hebrew, that's ben Adam, son of man, right? What is a son of man that you are mindful of him? By the way, cool fact, C.S. Lewis uses this phrase literally in his Chronicles of Narnia series when he has the Narnians refer to the humans as sons of Adam, right? Isn't that cool, ben Adam? Anyways, this phrase is not referring to the Messiah. It's most often a phrase that simply means human being right? As in Psalm 8, 4. 
This phrase is used differently in apocalyptic literature like Daniel and Revelation, however, where it refers to a specific individual. And that's why I think when Jesus uses the phrase in the Gospels, he's not, he's not saying, I am human, in the ordinary sense of the phrase, as Ezekiel might have used the phrase. I think he's using the apocalyptic meaning of this phrase, identifying himself as the Son of Man in Daniel 7. Anyways, he shows up before the Ancient of Days to receive authority, glory, and royal power. And as a result, all the nations of the earth worship him and his kingdom endures forever. And this is another theme from Daniel 2, where, where God dis God's kingdom destroys the others and lasts forever. Now, in Daniel 7, we see how this is accomplished. There will be a judgment, and the coming of the kingdom will be the investing in Jesus of all power. And as a result, true worship is restored to where it belongs. And this gives us a hint as to the nature of the little horn's boasting. It seems as if it's a challenge to Jesus' right to the kingdom. He's also redirecting the worship that belongs to God himself. Now, why do I say this? Because the solution to the little horn's boasting was to give Jesus the keys to the kingdom. And with the keys comes the loyalty and worship of the whole world. And this seems to end the matter. And that should have ended the chapter, but it doesn't. So let's get on to Thursday. I'm going to veer off course a bit on Thursday because I think this point is worth explaining. I 100% believe Daniel 7 was meant to end in verse 14. But Daniel is bothered by what he saw, and the idea of God's kingdom lasting forever doesn't comfort Daniel at all. In fact, in verse 15, he says he was troubled by what he saw, and that the vision disturbed him. In verse 19, just a few verses later, he calls the, first, the fourth beast, rather, most terrifying. And in verse 28, Daniel says he was deeply troubled and felt sick by that he kept this vision to himself. And this vision bothered Daniel, and that's why he asks the angel to explain it in verse 15. Now, the angel does explain it very briefly, but in verse 19, Daniel had more questions. The angel explains it again in a little bit more detail, but Daniel still isn't satisfied, and that's where the chapter ends, and that's why we have chapter 8. Daniel keeps focusing on this little horn's blasphemy and his persecution of God's people and his, his attempt to, to change times and laws. And the angel keeps redirecting Daniel back to the courtroom judgment in favor of God's people. Sometimes we let the bad news swallow up the good news, don't we? Yeah, man, all the time. But the, the, the point that uh, in Daniel 7 is that Judgment is the heart of this thing, not the beast, not the persecution, not any of this other stuff. The point is the judgment. Okay, it's not a detailed chronicle of all the little horns' crimes. The, the point is that the kingdom is given to the Son of Man. Worshippers return to God where it belongs. The beasts are judged and God's people are given justice. And I hope that's the point of the lesson as you teach it also. Don't get bogged down in the negative stuff. Right? The point is that God reigns and his kingdom is going to be coming to earth and everything will be set right. And Daniel had a hard time seeing the good news because the bad news seemed so kind of dark. It was a, it was a dark cloud over his head. It was hard for him to see past the bad news to the good news on the other side. And we have a job as teachers to help our, our, our class members, our students, to see past the darkness to the brightness of the coming of God's kingdom on the other side where everything will be set right. And that's good news, friends. That's good news. And that's also where we're going to stop this week. So study up, have a great class, and we'll see you next time.